Okay, uh, let, let's go ahead and get started then. So thanks everyone for joining us. I'm going to hand it over to Nick uh, uh, to get, a, get going with his presentation. Thank you very much. All right, thanks, John. Uh, can you guys hear me all right? I think so. Um, all right. Hello? Sorry, is there feedback again? All right. We can hear you okay. Oh, perfect. Good. All right, so thank you for the invitation. Um, I'm happy to talk to you guys today uh, again about organic photovoltaics. Um, so my last talk, uh, if you'd seen that before, focused a lot more on uh, introductory information to organic photovoltaics. Um, I'll have a little bit of a, of a refresher for that at the beginning of this talk, but the majority of this um, of this talk will focus on the current state of the art for the field and where I think it's headed in the next couple of years. Um, so with that, let's uh, go ahead and get started. So um, why do we need solar power? Um, this is a very similar figure I showed in my first talk. Um, this is just updated including the 2015 data. And so the US Energy Information Administration is predicting a 48% increase in global energy demand, with the majority of that demand coming from uh, developing countries like India, China, and uh, many of the African nations. So in order to meet that demand, it's expected that renewable energy will account for 31% of that total 48% um, increase. And uh, renewables have actually increased their um, total expected utili uh, utilization by 0.3 percent since the last time I presented this data. Um, I think that's really significant when we consider the advances that renewable energy has made just in the past couple of years. Um, so uh, of course that's totally dependent on uh, regulatory changes with respect to uh, CO2 emissions and things like that. Those would obviously also change those uh, projected outcomes. Um, if we look at levelized cost for renewable energy um, you can see that the total system uh, levelized costs for fossil fuels are pretty comparable with um, the levelized cost of electricity from different types of renewable energy, specifically onshore wind and solar PV. So something I hear a lot about is people saying, well, without the tax credits, the solar energy is not really viable. Um, I don't, I mean, if you just look at this figure, you can see that's not necessarily true. So. Um, Definitely, uh, you can anticipate solar energy will represent a large portion of the total renewable market, along with wind, um, in the coming years. Um, but out of all those different photovoltaic technologies, um, one of the ones that I personally am very interested in, uh, it's what I focus most of my research on um, as a graduate student, is uh, organic photovoltaics. So what is an organic photovoltaic and why do we care about them? Well, in general, an organic photovoltaic is a third generation technology uh, for photovoltaics. Um, that just means that it's in the same category as um, perovskites or uh, quantum dots or any of those other emerging photovoltaic technologies. They're uh, energetically cheap to produce, with some of them having paybacks as low as days or weeks. And uh, the tunability and flexibility of how these uh, devices and modules are made allows them to be dropped into a wide variety of applications, just some of which are shown in the images on the left, um, from something as small as a compact solar charger to a much larger grid system on the roof of, uh, of, uh, um, of buildings or commercial real estate. So to cover some of our basics, just as a refresher, um, an organic photovoltaic primarily consists of a bulk hetero junction so that's what you're seeing now um, between the top and bottom electrodes. The red here is depicted as the acceptor and the blue is depicted as the donor. And so what we usually consider when we talk about the bulk hetero junction, uh, which is that mixture of the acceptor and donor pair, um, we usually consider there to be localized regions of donor molecule and acceptor molecule. Um, but there's actually a third uh, region within the bulk hetero junction that's incredibly important. And that's where the blue and the red, in this case, would meet, or the amorphous region of the bulk hetero junction. Um, some of the best data right now is showing that the amorphous region is where the majority of these charges are generated um, that we use to generate electricity from these organic photovoltaic devices. And then the extended domains um, of the acceptor and donor are how we delocalize charges out to the electrodes. Um, 
because there's a wide variety of the, the processing conditions you can use to generate an organic photovoltaic, whether it be vapor deposited or solution processed, that means that we can, as long as it's a conductive material, you can basically make an organic photovoltaic on anything, whether it be a slightly flexible conductive plexiglass, uh, metal-backed electrodes, um, conductive plastics are really popular uh, in industry right now. Um, you can also even use uh, uh, different types of adhesive tape, uh, as long as it's conductive. Uh, I've even seen devices that are printed onto paper. Um, so there's a really wide range of possible avenues um, that you can take in terms of how you design your organic photovoltaic device. So focusing now on those two molecules, the acceptor and the donor, um, there's a wide variety of donor molecules, and I'll talk about what those really are in a minute. But here is just a survey of the different types. You can see we have small molecules in the top and bottom uh, mo uh, sections, and in the center there, those are uh, an, arrange, an arrangement of different types of polymer donors, um, all of which have been studied uh, fairly rigorously at this point to one extent or another. Um, and are a really exciting area of research that I'll talk about just in a minute. Um, we also have acceptors. So as far as acceptors go, much like the polymer and small molecule donors, there are two different, at least two different classes of acceptors. Uh, that's the fullerene-based acceptors, which you see here, and then the small molecule acceptors. Um, and I'll talk about both of those as well. But in general, before we go forward, we need to understand how the organic photovoltaic works so that we understand the significance of this donor and acceptor pair. So incident light comes in and excites what we would consider the HOMO of the donor molecule. And that causes an electron to be excited into the LUMO of the donor, at which point it becomes an exciton uh, electron hole pair. And then if the conditions for the de uh, device are correct, meaning the morphology is the way it's supposed to be, and um, the device structure and energy levels overlap correctly, the electron will be delocalized through the acceptor and then out through the cathode material, and then the hole will be uh, uh, similarly delocalized to the anode. Um, so as chemists, um, one of the really easy things for us to change is this VOC gap between the HOMO and the LUMO of the donor and the acceptor. That's actually uh, dictating our total VOC. Now, in different morphologies, you're actually going to see the HOMO and the LUMO energies change a little bit. And you can tell because, you know, if you're based on calculations, you know what your HOMO and LUMO gap should be. If you see your VOC is a little bit smaller or even a little bit higher is also possible. That's usually uh, due to differences in morphology. And then lastly, we have a small gap between the two LUMO energies of the uh, donor and the acceptor. And that is what we're calling our driving force. So the... Modern, the most up-to-date research that I'm aware of suggests this driving force has a smaller and smaller uh, impact on the total um, number of charges generated in the device. So a really small driving force is actually okay. You just have to have, it looks like you just have to have some form of driving force, some small gap between the donor and the acceptor in order to uh, efficiently delocalize charges. Um, lastly, uh, I personally work on acceptors, usually fullerene acceptors. Um, but for this talk, I'll be focusing on donors and acceptors uh, equally. So with that short intro in mind, uh, let's go ahead and dive into um, the recent advances in organic photovoltaics. So uh, in donors specifically, if we just uh, start with the polymers, um, polymer donors are definitely the most heavily researched class of donor material. Um, They've been around since the beginning of organic photovoltaics. Uh, P3HT is one of the earliest high-performing uh, donor polymers. Uh, very regularly, people were reporting uh, 1 to 3%, which at the very beginning of organic photovoltaics was incredibly exciting. Um, for the most part, people have moved away from poly 3 hexothiophene and they're moving into much more complex polymers now. So you see PTB7TH, or this uh, P136 is actually a research polymer um, that's shown some pretty high efficiencies. Um, and some special properties that uh, I'll bring up at the end of the talk. But um, basically these polymers come in a wide range of molecular structures. Um, and if we break it down by pros and cons, uh, so pros, polymers tend to have really broad um, absorption bands. You can tune them through functional group changes on the chemical level, 
Um, but because of that broad absorption band, it's uh, they have a they have a large absorption cross section, meaning they're picking up a lot of the photons in the solar spectrum, and uh, they have an easily modified 3D structure uh, because you can consider these polymer polymer interactions as another sort of knob to twist in terms of your uh, synthetic toolbox. And like I said, they've been researched very heavily, um, and so they are very well optimized to work well with a lot of the most common fullerene-based acceptors, which would be PCBM and PC70BM. Um, but the cons to polymers are kind of a kind of a big deal in terms of uh, making them industrially viable. Some people do it, um, and that's not to say it's impossible by any means. But um, purification of polymers is inherently pretty difficult. Um, you can get residual metals or uh, the size dispersity, meaning that if your oligomer chain length is uh, varying a large degree, or if you have stereo sites and you're not, you don't have regioselective polymer control, uh, all of those things have been shown to, in general, have a deleterious effect on the device performance. So from a research standpoint, because of these batch-to-batch uh, -batch differences that you can have, uh, just through uh, small amounts of impurity changes, that makes the um, reproducibility for a lot of these different types of studies uh, difficult to do, especially at the research level. Um, but that's why I'm really interested in small molecule donors. So small molecule donors have definitely gained uh, some popularity in the literature. If you do a basic literature sh uh, search for organic photovoltaics, you'd see that the majority of the hot papers or uh, most heavily cited and recently published papers in organic photovoltaics are coming from small molecule um, based research. So pros and cons, um, small molecules are much easier to purify in general than, po than polymers. Of course there's always exceptions, there's some donor molecules that will be more difficult, but in general there's a lot more techniques for pur purifying and characterizing um, small molecule donors than there are polymers. Um, and so that has led to, on the research side, a lot of studies on how we can exactly control this complex morphology that we're getting in these bulk heterojunctions. Um, and that's led to some huge strides. You see the efficiencies on these small molecules as 9.8% and 8.8%. Um, all these efficiencies, whether they were polymers or donors in this case, are all optimized against uh, PC70BM. And so that's why I really liked this, these comparisons. Um, so in cons, uh, they're, they're a newer area of study, so there's not as many examples in the literature. But like I said, they are the, the hot area of research in organic photovoltaics right now. So that is rapidly changing. And in general, most of the small molecule donors have lower conductivities than the uh, polymer donors, um, at, least, at least for the most part. Again, there are always outliers, but in general, that's been shown to be true. Um, so moving on to acceptors, uh, fullerene acceptors, these are by far the industry standard when we talk about acceptors in organic photovoltaics. They've been around since the beginning as well and um, show most of the highest efficiency devices are with uh, fullerene acceptors, though that is changing now. Um, but in pros, they have high conductivities and um, higher than the small molecule versions. Uh, or uh, polymer versions of uh, acceptor molecules. And they also have this 3D structure referring to the buckyball. Um, that 3D structure is believed to be responsible for a more efficient charge delocalization, which allows for um, uh, charges to delocalize and become free carriers throughout the device much more efficiently than in their 2D um, acceptor counterparts, so like small molecule acceptors. But uh, on the con side, uh, they do suffer from lower solubilities um, synthetically challenging, like I said, I work on um, fullerenes and fullerene syntheses. Um, in general, fullerenes are more difficult to work with than their uh, small molecule counterparts. Um, and also their narrow absorption band, which only is between uh, roughly like 300 nanometers to 425, 450, if you have a para addition. Um, so their absorption bands are relatively narrow, and when you're talking about trying to saturate um, the number of photons from the incident light from the solar spectrum, you want as broad an absorption band as possible. There's no reason that the acceptor can't contribute to the number of photons being absorbed by the device. So, um, like I said, acceptors are my specialty, so I have no problem breaking down into pros and cons for each one of these molecules specifically. Um, in, in terms of pros for PCBM, um, it's much. It's a relatively straightforward synthesis, especially as far as fullerenes go. 
Um, last time, last I was aware, Nano C owns the patent for the synthesis of PCBM or a synthesis of PCBM, and they are one of the bulk producers, and you can buy that commercially, which has made it much easier for a lot of research groups and industry to start comparing uh, different donor molecules. Um, util utilizing PCBM as sort of a standard. Um, also, in terms of their cons, uh, they do have PCBM uh, as well as PC70BM has poor thermal stability. Um, that just means you can't reliably use it in a vapor deposited device. Uh, it usually decomposes and my group specifically has published literature on that. Um, also, uh, it's been associated that uh, some of the burn-in or the initial burn-in or loss in PCE when the device is uh, first um, illuminated and tested, a lot of that is coming from the interactions with the fullerene. And so uh, with PCBM specifically, there's data that shows that that burn-in is coming from the PCBM. Um, for C60, it's much more thermally stable. You can think of it as a rock. Um, basically, when it's synthesized, it's just a... Uh, um, an arc discharge between two graphitic rods. So it's definitely the thermally stable compound. Um, and so it's definitely the most common to be used for vapor deposited devices. And then uh, also uh, in terms of its cons, it has a much lower solubility than PCBM. And its LUMO energy is uh, lower than most of the high efficiency donors that are out there right now. Uh, just meaning that the um, its, its, uh, its reduction potential is a little bit more positive than uh, PC60 and PC70BM. Um, lastly, PC70BM, like I said, that's if you're testing a new donor, it's pretty common in the literature to test it against PC70BM, and that's primarily because it sh usually shows higher efficiency devices. Um, it usually has a higher JSE or uh, current value and has been shown to have higher uh, device stability. Um, but PC70BM, specifically that C70, um, is more expensive than C60. Uh, if you want to think about it in terms of statistics, uh, when you generate um, C60 and C70 in that arc synthesis, um, C60 is, let's say, 70, about 70% 70 of the total mixture, and then PC70BM, or sorry, uh, C70, would be 20%. Um, with, uh, <clears throat> uh, or sorry, C60 would be 80%, and C70 would be 20%, and residual, any residual percentage would be left over um, higher fullerenes, usually sub 1%. Um, so that's why, with those things in mind, small molecule acceptors are a really exciting area of research. Um, they also have uh, uh, tunable band structures, just like the small molecule donors and polymers, um, and they're much cheaper to produce in general than the fullerene derivatives for acceptor molecules. Also, um, they do tend to have uh, lower conductivities compared to fullerenes, though there are a couple uh, molecules that uh, are getting closer to the fullerene conductivities, and they don't have that 3D moiety that I was talking about um, that allows that efficient charge delocalization, um, but some groups are specifically targeting ways to generate that 3D structure, and we'll talk about that. So um, starting from left to right, um, on the left, we have um, a pretty interesting uh, small molecule acceptor. Uh, that's mostly because of this little fact that um, this sub-NC, as well as two of its derivatives, uh, were used together in a tandem device um, to generate an 8.4% uh, efficiency tandem um, with minimal optimization. So that's really promising. That means that um, you don't have to worry about all the nuanced morphology control between different types of acceptor molecules. Um, being able to do this and then use the, utilize this type of acceptor, and it targets different sections of the absorption spectrum of the solar spectrum, uh, means that you could, in theory, generate uh, a tandem device a lot easier um, with less morphological control being required and more, uh, fewer studies. Um, so next up to the right, um, we've got a PDI or perylene diamide uh, derivative. So this was a class of acceptors that's been uh, utilized in the literature for a while now. Um, basically, they're in general very highly conducting and have a really large absorption cross section. They're very intense absorbers, and uh, they're also been shown to be uh, quite conductive. These are some of the molecules that get the closest 
in terms of conductivity for a lot of the fullerene acceptors. Um, but this is one of those examples where uh, the researchers have attempted to mimic the 3D structure. So you'll notice that um, bond uh, connecting the two, uh, the two molecules in the central, in the central uh, orange box. Um, that bond is not actually that long. These molecules are actually rotated or twisted uh, with respect to each other and that uh, in, it's believed that in the morphology they'll adopt something similar to a 3D-like structure that will allow for higher, um, higher charge delocalization in the bulk heterojunction. And then lastly, we can talk about uh, this uh, high-performing high uh, small molecule acceptor. This is ITIC-M, uh, in this case meta, and that's just referring to those uh, phenyl rings where they have that C6H13 functional group, uh, a hexyl chain coming off of the meta position. Um, so this molecule is really interesting. It's one of the um, small molecule acceptors that's actually achieved an 11.5% uh, PCE value, so that's really exciting. Um, it looks like the main reason this molecule is performing so well has to do with the degree of crystallinity um, in the bulk hetero junction. So the more crystalline domains you have, uh, in general that's going to mean uh, faster charge movement or uh, um, higher conductivity in the device. Um, one of the reviews that I was reading that mentioned this molecule actually said that uh, through further optimization of the, uh, of the VOC energy, um, you could actually potentially get up to 11.6% um, just by pairing the small molecule acceptor with a better donor that is uh, more tailored to its specific uh, LUMO energy. So uh, as far as cons, um, these molecules are in the early stages. Um, there's still not a lot of degradation type studies that are done with small molecule acceptors. It's more about developing molecules that work well in the first place. Um, so it's a bit early for me to uh, assign cons to all these different molecules. But that's definitely an area of research that's going to be uh, more heavily investigated in the future. So to sum up what we've just covered, um, polymer donors are definitely a huge area of the organic photovoltaic literature. They've been shown to work reliably and they have really high efficiencies, but they suffer from difficulties with purification. And so that's led a lot of researchers to push towards uh, some kind of alternative, which in this case would be small molecule donors. Um, and these donors are really taking off right now. They're getting efficiencies uh, up and above 10% reliably, um, and some that are even over 11, so uh, in tandems. So that's a really exciting area of research, but even more importantly, it's allowed us to target um, uh, target specific uh, experiments to understand how morphology is controlled by different functional groups on these small molecules because we can exclude so many of the variables that we have to deal with when we're talking about designing um, the morphology around polymers. Um, fullerene acceptors, much like polymers, are uh, sort of the standard in the literature. Um, Fullerene acceptors are still the highest uh, efficiency material to date in terms of acceptors, but small molecule acceptors are catching up uh, very rapidly. And so that's a very exciting area of research. Um, because small molecule acceptors, like I said, you can um, increase their absorption cross-section over the total solar spectrum, and that could automatically in, uh, give them an edge over fullerenes that maybe the fullerenes can't really achieve. Um, Further, you can uh, imagine controlling their morphology a lot more directed than you could uh, necessarily with a fullerene because you could change the functional groups because the synthesis of these small molecule acceptors in general is a lot easier than it is to change uh, fullerene acceptors. So with that uh, sort of the cutting edge research, that's where everyone's really looking right now is in how, how can we control morphology, um, how can we get higher and higher efficiencies utilizing small molecule acceptors and small molecule donors, uh, let's look at uh, some of the companies that are currently filling these different industry spaces. So uh, I'd be remiss if I did not mention Heliotech. Um, I think it's fair to say they're probably probably one of the, at least one of the industry leaders in this field. Um, if by uh, by any measure, I think it's pretty fair to say that Heliotech is one of the one of the leaders in organic photovoltaics at the industry level. Uh, they focus on BIPV or building integrated photovoltaics. Uh, they utilize a uh, roll-to-roll processing uh, technique to produce vacuum deposited organic photovoltaics. 
uh, use, utilizing small molecule donors. And they also hold the record efficiency uh, for an organic photovoltaic at 13.2% uh, for a tandem device. Um, further, the, one of their big milestones is that they currently uh, have the largest uh, building integrated photovoltaic, uh, organic photovoltaic installation uh, in France, and that was actually that roof that you saw in one of the earlier slides. Um, that's actually a series of roofs, and that's uh, there's actually YouTube videos that show the um, the solar installers uh, putting their heliofilm down, and it's very simple. It's a almost a, like a tape, and you pull the backing off, and then smooth out the film on top of the on top of the roof, and that's it. Um, lastly, they've uh, they've been able to raise a hundred million dollars, uh, uh, more than a hundred million dollars, I should say for a uh, uh, production line to produce their Helia film, and that'll be able to produce uh, a million square meters per year. So that's really exciting for Heliotech. Uh, it's definitely a company to watch for. Um, they initially started at 3% efficiency devices. Their uh, mission statement is to get to 15, and with this tandem device, they're able to get to 13. So I think that's, I think that's a pretty, uh, pretty promising, promising feather in their cap at this point. Um, so another company very similar to Heliotech, actually out of Brazil, called Sunnu Energies, uh, or Sunnu. Um, they also focus in building integrated PV, but they actually use a, uh, a printed um, device, so that's solution process. And they've expanded into a lot of different avenues. So they're putting their devices onto uh, tractor trailers and other transportation technologies, so like buses and trains, um, to uh, drive some of those more secondary systems um, without pulling directly off of the engine or the alternator in that case. Uh, they also hold the record for the world's largest uh, organic photovoltaic building facade. Um, so that's exciting. And they are currently the largest producer of, uh, of uh, or operational capacity for organic photovoltaics. Um, their, their production line is already online and they're at 400,000 meters squared per year. So that's really exciting. This is definitely also a company to watch in terms of the leaders in the organic photovoltaic uh, field and just in terms of sheer production value. So um, there's a lot of different ways to uh, go into the OPV market or the organic photovoltaic uh, market. So Opvious is a really interesting company, and I actually uh, I like them quite a bit. Um, so what they've focused on is uh, an adaptive production. So they mostly focus on what I would consider custom work. So uh, you can see they have a wide variety of what, what I would call very beautiful installations um, from uh, this <clears throat> uh, African uh, consulate building or um, uh, printing their devices onto stickers or having completely transparent solution pr process devices uh, where they utilize nanowires on the top and bottom contacts. So um, because of their really adaptive production approach, they can fill almost any kind of demand. Uh, they can produce devices of a wide range of colors um, and transparencies and flexibilities. Uh, so they, they are definitely a company that's utilizing the full extent of what organic photovoltaics are capable of in order to meet different types of uh, customer needs. And then uh, the last company I'm going to talk about is called uh, um, Infinity PV. I have to be honest, I really like this company. <laughs> I, I think this company is really cool. Um, and that's primarily as a researcher, one of their, one of their um, products that you can buy on their website is actually DIY kits for how to install organic photovoltaics. Uh, you can even buy the inks and the hardware um, and study your own organic photovoltaic. I think that's really awesome. Uh, that's moving towards this uh, sort of global outreach for organic photovoltaics and increase the public consciousness of what organic photovoltaics are and what they bring to the table. They are the producer for the world's smallest compact solar charger. Um, that is exactly the kind of niche applications that organic photovoltaics are perfect for filling. Um, you can buy uh, different um, um, sized pieces of their organic photovoltaic solar cell foils. Uh, they come in a variety of PCEs, 2%, 3%, and 4%, um, and uh, different lengths. And you can buy all of those right off their website. So in that sense, they're commercially 
uh, open to any type of consumer. And so I, I as, a, as a researcher, I think this company is really, really cool. So um, to sum them up, uh, there's a lot of different ways for companies to enter the organic photovoltaic market. I would say the majority of the industry people in the market right now are looking towards building integrated photovoltaics, which are um, a huge area of applications and demand uh, in, the, in the market right now. Um, there's also a couple other ways to make uh, to enter this uh, industry. Uh, of course, Next Energy Technologies, which we're all familiar with, uh, they focus specifically on generating uh, highly transparent, um, high-efficiency solar cell uh, windows. Um, so that's also in that building integrated photovoltaic, but a much smaller scale. So we're not looking towards uh, non-transparent films, but focusing on uh, transparent windows. And then Nanoflex Power Corporation. Um, so that's one of the other avenues to uh, generate money or, or revenue in this in this space. So what they utilize is they are heavily invested research company and then when they develop an interesting technology they patent it and that patent is up for lease um, and they have a wide number of patents. They've been in operation for quite some time. Uh, they don't just have organic photovoltaic patent technology, uh, patented technology, but they also focus on batteries and uh, other related markets. Um, but that is definitely a viable uh, means of making money in the organic photovoltaic uh, industry. Um, there are quite a few companies that uh, utilize them in that way as well. So uh, with that, uh, let's go ahead and transition into talking about the future for organic photovoltaics. So this is why I, um, I really like these two images to explain this, uh, to at least uh, consider where we've come in terms of the organic photovoltaic industry. So this uh, picture at the top with the um, young kid uh, listening to a first-generation iPod. Um, he's plugged into a Kanarka uh, uh, OPV film, and so he's charging his iPod while he listens to it off of this uh, Kanarka film. Um, so that's back, uh, that's a few years ago. This uh, promotional material is from 2010. So here, uh, in comparison, we have the Helion, uh, which actually started as a Kickstarter, um, technology so you can charge your iPhone on a much smaller uh, per square meter film and so that just shows like how much how much better the technology has gotten in uh, in such a short period of time so I think it's a really fun comparison um, so the first technology I'm really interested in is uh, wide band gap devices so this is getting closer towards the BIPV just in terms of direct applications uh, so you can envision a wide band gap device basically just means that you've intentionally engineered a gap in the absorption bands for the uh, for the material for the for the device that you would generate, um, and you would reasonably for a transparent device you would have that gap overlap the solar spec the most visible portion of the solar spectrum, so that would lead to this transparent device. Um, solar windows that are transparent and things like that they're utilizing this uh, wide band gap. Uh, in order to uh, 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 make those devices transparent. So that's one direct way to consider using a wide band gap device, but there's other ways actually. So you could also envision a tandem or ternary device where uh, you have your uh, wide band gap material and then the area that's left empty, you use another uh, donor or the acceptor even, if that's what lines up with the, that portion of the visible spectrum. You can imagine having really high absorption cross-section in terms of the um, absorption of the individual photons, uh, getting a really high efficiency of that absorption, and then adding different donors and acceptors in a stacked format to capture as many photons as possible of the available solar spectrum. And that's actually how uh, Heliotech reports that they came up with their, their tandem device. It's a three-part device. It uh, utilizes um, one, one level that focuses on the green portion of the solar spectrum, and then another level that focuses on, on the red light, and the last one being infrared. And so that was how they were able to get to 13.2%. Um, the theoretical efficiency for these types of devices, if you could imagine a tandem that perfectly absorbed all of the photons, it's something like 30 uh, percent. That's based on calculations and it's really difficult, especially with organic photovoltaics, to, to lock that value down. Um, but in general, that's, that's what we consider to be the absolute theoretical limit. Um, 
So tandems are definitely an area of research that um, as they get more and more explored and wide band gap devices get uh, tailored towards those, you're going to start seeing much higher efficiencies. Uh, this P136 is actually a wide band gap polymer and uh, with the correct uh, morphology and uh, acceptor pair, you're able to get 10.3 percent efficiency from that device. Um, another uh, technology that I think uh, you could actually consider this kind of moving away from a, uh, a certain area of research, I hope, um, but right now to get the highest efficiency devices, there's usually um, post-processing that's required for the organic photovoltaic bulk heterojunction. Um, that's either solvent annealing or thermal annealing. Now, on the research scale, these processes are fine. Um, you can see that they do have a rather dramatic effect. Um, on the left, you can look at the, uh, the solvent annealing process. That's basically when you take your bulk heterojunction device and you place it in a chamber that has a, uh, a saturated vapor pressure of whatever high, um, uh, high vapor pressure solvent you're using to solvent anneal your device. And that's just to allow the molecules a little bit more flexibility to approach the exact morphology that is uh, the highest um, efficiency morphology uh, so that well, that would be the most conductive with the highest fill factor and things like that. Um, so you can see it makes a pretty dramatic effect. Uh, in terms of the um, PCE values. And then for thermal annealing, you can see that uh, the device on the left for the thermal annealing, these are um, AFM image, images or atomic force microscopy. And so the figure of merit here is this RMS value. That's the root mean squared. Um, the root mean squared value, basically the larger that value, the rougher the surface in this particular measurement. And uh, on the left, this is a device that has not been thermally annealed, and it's relatively smooth. And then on the right, you see a device that has been annealed. Uh, most people anneal for like 10 minutes at 90 degrees or 100, um, and then optimize in that range. And for this device, annealing uh, did improve the efficiency, but more importantly, you can see the morphological changes. So you can see the roughness has gone up, and that's because the crystalline domain, domains have become larger, which is giving rise to higher conductivities, and higher efficiencies. The problem with these things is um, <clears throat> you can control morphology a couple different ways uh, in terms of the solvent that you're uh, using to spin or if you're on the industrial scale print your device or uh, vapor deposition you can control the rate at which it's deposited and that'll change the morphology or the fullerene acceptor ratio or, or uh, sorry the fullerene acceptor donor uh, ratio um, so you can change a lot of these variables and control the morphology without having to do solvent annealing, solvent annealing and thermal annealing, which is going on in the top set of images. And I've discussed this image before, um, but you're seeing a very large difference in terms of the morphology by changing variables. In this case, we're changing the uh, fullerene to donor ratio, or we're changing the solvent that they were spin casted from. Um, it doesn't really matter what they were, but the point is that you can control it without having to do these secondary processes. So as I said, on the research scale, these secondary processes are fine. They're incredibly valuable to researchers, but on the industrial scale, you can envision a much more simple production line by not having to utilize these different technologies, the, the thermal annealing or the solvent annealing processes. So I think in the future, if we uh, get better and better at understanding how to control the morphology for these devices, whether through changing the functional groups on the molecules or the way that we're depositing them. Uh, we could consistently start producing devices that don't require solvent annealing or thermal annealing. And I think that's where a lot of industry level uh, research is going to is going to be targeting. Um, and then lastly, as far as uh, thrust areas, uh, one, of the, one of the big critiques for organic photovoltaics, um, especially solution process devices, um, is you have to evaporate a large amount of, of uh, solvent, and these solvents are usually chlorinated organics. Um, that's because they have high solubilities for the donor and acceptor molecules, and uh, their viscosities line up well with several different types of uh, solution processed uh, production methods. That being said, a lot of people criticize uh, organic photovoltaics, saying they can't be environmentally friendly because of all the organic solvents that have to be uh, that have to be dealt with after they're produced. 
So what I would say to that, um, yes, of course, uh, you'll see there are people that publish right now focusing on you know making devices out of green solvents. Um, there's def that's definitely a viable area of research, and some people are working on that. But it's from my perspective, um, I think it's so difficult already to get really high efficiency devices where you're not limiting yourself by what you can and cannot use. Um, so I think it's uh, it's going to be more cost effective to research different types of solvent storage or solvent recapture uh, technologies, and those are already pretty well established processes, at least for the industrial level. Solvent recapture makes a lot of sense, and I think that's where um, a lot of these types of chlorinated organics um, and things like that that are currently used in solution process devices, I think that's how a lot of companies will look towards dealing with these things. Um, and then you could envision recycling or repurifying and then recycling those chlorinated solvents to make more devices. I think at the end of the, at the, end of the day, that will be the most cost effective, but that's my personal opinion. Um, so in summary... What we've talked about today is mostly focused on the most exciting things going on in organic photovoltaics right now. So we're seeing really high efficiencies coming out from uh, small molecule donors and acceptors with some efficiencies as high as 11.5%. Um, we still have a record efficiency of 13.2% from Heliotech for a tandem device. And uh, as far as the market is concerned, the number I hear reported most often as the uh, sort of industrially viable uh, efficiency value is about 15 percent. Uh, I don't know how true that is. I think that depends on the application, but that is the value that I see reported a lot. Um, uh, furthermore, we're developing better techniques all the time for controlling the morphology of these devices, allowing us to make them more reproducibly, and that's how you can see so many different industry uh, industry level companies um, producing large amounts of these devices reliably. Um, we've gotten better at understanding the degradation for these different types of uh, devices and encapsulation technology has improved a lot. That's allowing us to give to get slightly longer lifetimes, um, much uh, more than long enough to uh, enter the, the, the um, BIPV market or the building integrated photovoltaic market. Um, you're seeing a lot of organic photovoltaics being utilized in niche applications and low light conditions where uh, the PCE value for a first or second generation photovoltaic would be lower anyway. Um, in those cases, the OPV devices actually excel because they don't require such high light in order to get fully saturated because their active layers are so thin. Um, and then lastly, due to their high degree of customizability, low cost, and uh, they can be transparent, there's just such a range of um, applications that uh, are it's basically only limited by your imagination in terms of what you can do with uh, some of these high-performing organic photovoltaic devices. So uh, with that, um, I'd like to acknowledge <laughs> uh, some of the reference literature that I used to put this talk together. Um, like I said, I focus on acceptors, so a lot of the donor-based aspects of my talk, um, I relied heavily on uh, several of these really nice reviews, very thorough, and uh, they were very helpful in me putting this talk together. And I'd also like to thank my group, of course, uh, and specifically Steve and Olga for looking over my slides and helping me, uh, you know, catch those little spelling errors and uh, terminology mistakes. And I'd also like to give a big shout out to uh, Sunnu and Optius. They both uh, helped me out by sending me some promotional materials um, to better understand exactly what it is that their companies do and um, help me produce this presentation. And uh, with that, um, I'd be happy to open the floor to any questions you guys have. Great. Thank you so much, Nick. Um, we'll, let's, we'll see if anyone has any questions at the moment. Um, there was none that were in, in the chat window, but uh, if anyone would like to speak up. Feel free to either use your microphone or uh, you, could, you could type something in now if you have a question. Yeah, I don't think so. Okay, yeah, it looks like you covered everything. <laughs> so thank you again. Uh, in
for those of you who might have missed the previous talk that Nick gave a couple, about two years ago, um, well, I'm going to post a video of this, and uh, and we'll we'll link to that one as well, so you could kind of get a, a precursor uh, and learn a little bit more about some of the things he didn't touch on today. But uh, thank you again, Nick, and uh, thank you everyone for tuning in. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity, guys.